This Coast E Clinic features Bruce Morton discussing layout without a plan, changes as you go along. Recorded on October 22, 2022. So as David was mentioning, you, you notice how the tracks don't quite line up right. And that's on purpose for the title. I tried not to do that on the layout. But this is basically a little story about my layout and what I've done along the way. Um, it's not done. Um, like a lot of model railroads, it probably won't ever be done. But um, we'll talk about... Oops, I lose it every time. Let's just go without it. Um, so most of us who want to build a layout put together a plan or two. Um, and I used a, um, a CAD program, actually Third Planet, and I must have done several hundred plans. Not, not all a whole lot different. They just kind of evolved. And I said, I don't like that, so I changed it. And the neat thing about the CAD programs is you can save as you go along and you can always back up and pull that one up again and go down a, a different stream if you want. But we dream about what kind of a railroad we want a lot of times for a long, long time before we even put anything together. And I have this friend who built a, a good sized layout. He tore it down, he's building another one, but right now he's in a planning stage. But he worked for the, uh, the movies as a prop uh, designer and builder. And one of the things he said the other day was, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. So he says, build it, then fix the heck out of it later. So that's an interesting idea. And it is something that's worthwhile doing. Um, certainly planning is important. And I put down some planning tools here. Pen and paper is real easy. Uh, better yet is pencil, paper, pencil eraser and paper. Then you can make your changes. There are a lot of computer programs and I put a bunch down. Um, I'm sure there's more. I'm not sure all these ones are still in existence either, even. One of the best planning tools is visiting other layouts. And if you're into operations, operating on those layouts will give you some feel for what you like to do, what you want to do on your layout, um, and, and the camaraderie of visiting and operating with other people is the best part of this hobby anyway, as far as I'm concerned. So I have gone to some resources. The Layout Design Special Interest Group is all about designing your layout. And they have a group on IO on the group's IO uh, that you can go to and just listen or ask questions, whatever. The operations special interest group is really designed for operations, and they also have a, a group's IO list. I should make a disclaimer here. I am the vice president of the OPSIG at the moment, so I have a bias, but I also do a lot of stuff for the LD SIG. And for for us as Coast Division people, I want to encourage you. The Bay Area SIG meet has been going on for I don't know how long. I've been going since before 2004, so probably 20 years. And they're going to have the meet um, on February 4th, 2023. I'm not sure where it's going to be yet. We're looking at Alameda. There's a couple of places we, we're looking at at the moment. Um, it will be a hybrid, so you can go in person or um, do it virtually. We may be meeting down in the South Bay if we can't find a good place in Alameda. If we go South Bay, we're probably going to be at the um, South Bay Historical Society there at the Santa, Santa Clara Depot. But just, just a plug for all three of these things, the LD SIG, the Op SIG, and the Bay Area SIG meet. So me, I've been model railroading for a long time. This is, uh, these are a couple of pictures my dad took of myself and my sister. Um, obviously getting into model trains here on the left, but on the right, this is a wooden footbridge that went across, well, 
kind of wooden metal frame wood footbridge that went across the bull ring yard down in Los Angeles. And so we'd go down there occasionally and watch trains. So that was kind of fun. And when I first started, uh, you made a, a car by putting a box together and putting paper sides on it. You guys remember that, don't you? When I got to college, I didn't have a lot of space, but I put a shelf up on my bookcase above my desk and built this little uh, 10 foot logging railroad. And it worked pretty well. It was fun, DC. But you know, if you keep it simple, just uh, direct, direct current, don't have to go with any of these fancy things, simple wiring, just two wires, one train so you don't have any meats. And if you have a square, you could just do a round and round, like uh, kind of like this. But you know what? That gets kind of boring. You can imagine things. I modeled the Southern Pacific. They used to have a train that pulled oil from Bakersfield over to Hatchapi to Mojave. And they later on used it from San Ardo um, down to Wilmington in the harbor area of Los Angeles. It was called the cans. And here's my version of the SP cans. The reason I did this is because I could put the track down, glue it down, and then put the cans on top and hold it down, weighted it. And I just thought, oh, this is fun. Let's put an engine in front of it. So the first thing you want to do is negotiate your space. You need to know how big a space you have to even start planning. Then you clear the space, prepare it, and then fill it with your plan. And for sure, get help. So my negotiations were for half of a garage for a long time. Uh, but unfortunately, the half filled up. I don't know what it is about garages, but they sent they have a tendency to collect everything. Um, but a lot of this is train stuff. If you if you look in here, you look closely, there's old layouts and Athern kits and NMRA convention bags and train magazines, G scale stuff, even prototype uh, switch stands and rails and things. But you have to get it out of there if you're going to put the layout. If you look real closely here, along the left side of the picture, there's a line. When we first moved into this house, I drew this line. I painted a line on the garage floor and told my wife, I want that side for the layout and we can park the car on the other side. Well, as I got to planning, that wasn't going to work. So um, I said, well, how about if I have the rest? And she said, it's OK, as long as I can still have my washer and dryer in the room. So that's what we did. Car doesn't stay there anymore. Like I said, get lots of help. Originally, the garage was half finished. My wife and I had to put up a couple extra um, beams in the ceiling. The joists were 24 inches apart, except for the last two bays, which were 48 inches apart. Can't put up drywall that way. So we put up a couple more uh, joists. Um, once it all got done, everything looks pretty good. Even have some L girder bench work there against the window. But I decided I'd seal the concrete floor because the concrete dust just keeps coming. It doesn't stop. And I got my wife to help me out. So like I said, get some help. I do model the SP. Um, Right now I'm modeling 1994, a couple of years before the merger with Union Pacific. Um, there's a possibility I'll backdate and I'll talk to you about that at the end. So where I'm modeling um, is in the Santa Barbara area. This is Santa Barbara right here. And so I model a little 10 mile or a 20 mile section right in through here. And uh, most of this isn't modeled at all. 
Uh, this section in here is modeled from White Hills on the branch and then from Surf up to Devon, about here. And that's it. And it's on the second level and we'll see that later. So I started with the first level. Um, as I said, the washer and dryer is still in the room. The rest is basically just a big oval. It just, it goes around the outside like this and then right back around and you can do it over and over and over again. The staging yards are, are off, the, off the oval on both sides. Byron Henderson did a plan like this in the 2004 model railroad planning. His uh, oval in the middle was the Santa Maria Valley. And I think that he still has it on his Layout Visions webpage. If you, if you uh, Google Layout Visions, you can find Byron's webpage. Um, so that was my first, first level. This is after a lot of drawings and trying to figure out what I could fit in the space. So here's what it looked like. Um, you can see that the West staging area over here, uh, the helix in the back. Um, this is the Santa Barbara area here. Not much of anything in the layout. There's another view of the, the staging yard. The second level, once I went to the second level, it basically is the same layout as the first level. It just doesn't have big yards or not much of anything in it, except that here at Surf, there is this Y and the back, the, the leg of the Y goes all the way into Lompoc. So it's on a shelf above that West staging yard. And this has an extension that goes out into the driveway. <laughs> And then this goes up a 3% grade and around the helix. So it's over the top of the track that comes in and it goes over to the White Hills uh, mine, the diatomaceous earth mine down in Lompoc. So that's basically the branch. It's about 60 feet long, um, about a hundred feet for each level and then 40 feet in the helix to get from one level to another. So about 240 feet from a uh, start of visible layout to the end of the visible layout. I'm not really going to talk about the helix, but the helix ended up having two helices in the same spot. Um, the one in the middle takes it from the top all the way down again into this, this uh, staging yard. So you can go from one staging yard to another, or you can go from one staging yard all the way across the layout and then to the other staging yard. So it's always point to point unless you just run around continuous. So these are just some views showing the second level. This is the Wyatt Surf. At this point, I was using um, a hardboard spline, masonite spline. And it, it was really nice for, for making nice transition curves from one place to another. It looked like this. Um, but I had some issues leveling it out. Um, it wasn't level either longitudinally or laterally. So we ended up replacing most of it with uh, plywood. So you can see some of the hard, hardwood, uh, hardboard uh, spline here. Um, and then here's the, the plywood going into place. We used the splines to mark where the tracks went and we just laid new flex track down on top. So this is relaying all the area and adding track in the Goleta area. Originally, uh, there were just two tracks here, the main and the siding. And we added the, the house track and a, an industry spur here. So this is just in the process. So even, even though you do all this planning ahead of time, once you start building, there's changes that you can make. Um, I'm making these before I add any scenery, obviously, and I don't wait for the scenery. This is an operating session. We brought a train over from Santa Barbara um, and switched out both um, Goleta and La Patera. This is some of 
my local club members. I had an interesting situation here that I'll talk about briefly. Um, there, this was a hole that this brown area, and it's just a just a foam piece. Down underneath is the east yard, and I didn't want to block the whole thing, so I wanted to have it so it was removable. So I laid track on it. There's transition tracks that go across, and there's a plug underneath so you can unplug the wiring, and it seems to work okay, but I haven't had any emergencies yet, so we'll test it later, or maybe not, hopefully not. Um, but this is more of that addition of track down at La Patera. So Bruce, ju just a question. So is that addition done because as you did operations, you found that you needed more interest in that area or kind of what drove those changes? Well, actually um, it was on the original plan and I just hadn't figured out how to do it. And so when I got to this point, then I looked at it and I said, oh, this would be pretty easy to just add a, a, a removable section here and then put what I need to in there. And there's uh, actually, there's I was actually, thinking more about the house track at Goleta, that oh. additional. No, that was in the original plan also. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I just had not added it. It was something down the road. I wanted to get the main and the sidings in so I could start running. Um, but I was going to add that house track and the industry track over in Goleta as well. Cool. Uh, most of the track arrangements are based loosely on the actual track arrangements that Southern Pacific had. And I've gotten, I'll, I'll show, show all of you later how, how I get there, but this is, this is the La Patera area and we'll probably see that again later. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the structure later. Although maybe take a quick look and remember this. See how this is just a foam core with a photograph pasted on the top of it. That's all it is. And from this side, it looks terrible, but here it doesn't look too bad. But these are just stand-ins. So I had this interesting problem that demanded a change. This is an industrial area in Santa Barbara. There's, there's quite a few industries down in here that need to be switched. But what happens is that the trains come in here on the red main line or the siding, and they have cars that get dropped off or picked up here in Santa Barbara. And this is the yard over here on this top part. So once they drop the cars off, how do the cars get from here to here? Well, they have to go out the lead and then down the siding and out this end and then way back again, and then take this, this switch here into the industrial, or they go out the other way, come out this end, go all the way past so we are on single track and then come back in and come back in on this little side track. And I said, that doesn't make sense. It's got to be a way to get across faster than that. So what we did was we put a, a crossing between the two double track mains. So then all you have to do is come out to this, come down, do a little seesaw, and you're back in. So that works pretty well. And in fact, that's what the real railroad did. You can see the crossover right here between the two mains. There's another picture of it shooting the other direction. So I just put the same thing in on the real on my layout. Here's one of the mains. This is the line that goes into the industrial area. This is the other main, and then this is the yard over here. So what I did was, um, okay, so it's between these two tracks. So I just put in some, um, Homosote roadbed, sanded it all down, got it ready, replaced a couple sections with some turnouts, connected them up, and we're done. 
So now I've got a crossover and I can get from one place to another without as much trouble. So the pictures are really helpful for research. Um, this is an old aerial photograph of Santa Barbara. This is actually taken after the June 29th, 1925 earthquake. Um, a lot of buildings fell, collapsed. Uh, Stern's Wharf collapsed. This is an interesting picture because it doesn't even have a breakwater here. This is about two years before Max Fleischmann built his little breakwater that's still there. But this is the main line for Southern Pacific. This is the ice house down here at the bottom. The, the roundhouse is just out of the picture below. The station that's still being used by Amtrak is right here. But my interest was this freight house. Guess I really wanted the freight house on my layout. So you blow up the picture and you can see it better. Um, there are some other tracks in here that go out here. But this is this building is still here. This building is still here. Uh, I think this one is too. There's quite a few things that are still here. And this is a, a 1925 aerial photograph. So this is what the freight house looked like. Get some photographs. Um, this is another photograph of it, although it's, they were concentrating on the engine, obviously. And then in 1970, they tore it down. They dismantled it all. This is a Sanborn map. And it shows, uh, it shows the, the freight house and the trackage. Um, not always a great idea to rely on the trackage, but it's helpful. Um, here's the other spurs that showed a little bit in that other photograph. Another resource is Google Maps. You can do aerials of Google Maps. And in fact, here is the tracks going through town. They've changed the routing of the the roadways. If you look back at the Sanborn map, it says Santa Barbara and Cabrillo. And Santa Barbara is this street right here. And it used to go right straight through to Cabrillo. And it doesn't anymore. They've made Garden Street curve around and become the main drag. So the freight house sat right here. And in fact, if you got real close, which I think I can, here's the concrete ramp that was on one of those spurs behind the freight house that sat right here. So it's still there. Um, so you can, you can do a railroad archaeology with a lot of resources if you, if you look around. The other place to look is, is some of the museums. Um, this is a, a freight house in El Centro. It's not quite as long, but it gives you the idea and I can use it a little bit to, to build the, the freight house. This particular drawing came from the so Southern California Railroad Museum, the old um, Orange Empire Museum down in Paris, California. But the California State Railroad Museum also has a lot of these drawings. So you just have to get to the place where they have them and then access them and you're in business. The other place is that several people, no, not several. I have a good friend, Jean-Guy Dubay, who is a draftsman and he draws these things. He did the drawings um, in Henry Bender's uh, station book. And he's done a book of his own just on, um, on depots, SP depots. So this was in there. It's not, a, it's not a freight house, but it has the same feel as that freight house. Uh, the freight house obviously has a dock all the way down. And in fact, they use the offices at that freight house as the dispatching office 
for Santa Barbara for a long time until they tore it down. So here's the place where I was going to put it. I added some track down the back side so it would make full use of both both this side. We really don't want to put cars over here because this is the main. This is main, this is main, this is yard over here. So um, I, I put down just a piece of paper to say, well, this is the footprint. What can I build in that? I made some mistakes, but here's my mock-up. It doesn't look too bad, but it's too small. It's scale-wise, it's more like uh, 1 to 96 or even 1 to 120. It needs to be bigger. So I'm probably going to have to do some compression on the on the, the building to get it in place. The other thing I found is that I, I had some fluorescent shop lights and I decided I'd try something else and I found these LED shop lights on uh, Amazon for about 60 bucks for what a, I think there's eight of them or something. Yeah, eight of them for $60. And they're just uh, little strip lights but they really do a good job. You can see, I don't know whether you can or not. Yes, you can. This is an old shop light. And then there's the other, the LED lights. And they just uh, daisy chain from one to another. So it works out pretty well. And it gives me plenty of light, a lot more light than, than the shop lights had. So I've, I've changed that. I also put some under deck lighting in. I got uh, some LED strips and I, that's what the strip looks like with the LEDs are the yellow ones. And when you put them up, I put them on a um, quarter round so that they shine up and not down. Um, one, one person commented that when you have the LEDs and they're shooting down, you get these spots on the rails when you take photographs. I don't notice them when I'm looking, but when I took the photographs, I don't see them either. This is this is with the LEDs in the industrial area in Santa Barbara. Here's the west staging area without the LEDs, and here it is with it. Just you get a little more light down the down the whole row. So I've added that. That's that was not in the original plan. Neither was detection. Um, I'm going to make another plug for a coast division business, but the model railroad control system, Seth Newman has a whole lot of neat uh, electronic things. And I'm using their CPODs for my detection. I've detected all the, the main, all the way around the, the layout. And I'm gonna use that to run some searchlight signals. So I'm building the searchlight signals from showcase miniatures. They turn out pretty good and they're being driven. It's all DTC. Um, so I, I don't have to do a whole lot. It just runs off itself. Um, the pro it's all run off of a, a signal controller that Seth does sell. It's Dennis Drury's um, design. Dennis was a SP. What do I want? I don't want to say signalman, but he was kind of. He ran their um, detection car for a long time. And Dennis is also a, PS, a PCR member. He's in the Sierra division. But he's got this really nice little controller. You daisy chain the detections together through this controller and it runs the signals. So COVID came along and we had lots of Zoom meetings and a lot of time at home by myself. And I was thinking of other things to do. And a couple of people started doing um, Zoom operations. And so I started looking at that and looked at what they'd done and really wanted to do it, but I didn't move along as fast as I wanted. So I have not done this. Uh, Bob Rodriguez, 
uh, Pete Mulvaney up in Canada and Dave Ablis back in um, in in New Jersey are all doing it. I've operated at Dave's in person, but um, they all were operating remotely using some of the the stuff they used Wi-Fi throttles, and we use Wi-Fi throttles locally using a Raspberry Pi. Actually, works better than the. <laughs> The throttles that are provided with the system that we use. Um, I put some layout cameras in. You can see the cameras mounted in a few places here, and they're designed to see most of the layout, not all of it. And the view it gives is not, well, I'll show it to you in a minute, but the view I, I get from the cameras is an overall view. It doesn't help me with um, switching or anything. Also tried some locomotive cameras. Um, so I got this one, the camera is circled in red. The driver is this big box, which actually fits inside this dummy locomotive with the camera sitting right in the engineer's window. So you truly get an engineer view as you use the camera. I tried it with uh, some other um, small cameras and I did some videos and I'll try and show those at the end. This is from the cameras that I showed you earlier. So you get a view of, of most of the layout, but you don't get, it's not a close view. So you can see both levels. Here's Carpinteria down here. Here's Surf up above. Uh, it shows you um, all the almost everything. I mean, this is this is Santa Barbara. You come around here, and then the train would go that way. Then it goes around this way. Uh, I don't have anything along the garage door, which you see in the background. Um, but you do you can follow the trains in a lot of places. This is this is actually Galita over here. I don't know what that's Galita. You can see the washing machine over here, and then this is Devon up top. But I never got that far. Uh, we were also going to use uh, cats to help us out in terms of dispatching, so that people could use cats at a distance and still operate the layout. That's the start of cats. Cats is a uh, started out as, as now everybody calls it computer automated traffic system, but it was originally designed for Pat Lana's layout, uh, which was the Crandic. So it was the Crandic automated traffic system. Rodney Black has put it together. He's gotten a lot of help along the way. And there is a group's IO list for cats as well. Um, I'm terrible at wiring. You know, I thought DCC, this will be easy. You just have two, two power, power bus and you do some feeders to the track and you're in business. It's almost as simple as DC direct control, direct, uh, yeah. Uh, direct current operation but you know as you go along you keep adding stuff and the tracks start looking really the wire underneath looks terrible after a while and if you aren't careful you you're going to lose everything so this is a camera this is a power strip here's a sub bus there's throttle buses in here auxiliary power then the all the wires that go for the tortoise from the switch and to the tortoise itself. Well, what I should be doing is this, putting tags on things every once in a while so we can at least know where things are. And so that's something else that I'm planning to do but haven't gotten to yet. I'm gonna end up with a little bit more about structures and, and how I do some of the research on it. Um, I really haven't done a lot, but it's it's stuff that needs to be done. It, if you put a, a, a depot on or a, an industry, it really kind of puts the um, 
puts the, the layout in a location that's easily identifiable. So I'm hoping to have seven depots and three shelters along the right of way. I have some kits, um, but most of it's gonna be scratch building. So the depots are Carpinteria, Summerlin, Santa Barbara, Goleta, Surf, Lompoc, and Casmelia. And there were shelters at Serena, Miramar, and Tangier. Um, I really mix up my, um, my era when I do the depots. A lot of the depots lasted for a long, long time. So that's okay. But others came and went really quickly and probably shouldn't be on my depot, my, my layout, but I'm gonna have them there anyway. So collecting photographs is always a good idea if you can find them. Um, I live in Carpinteria, so I have access to the historical museum here, and I've picked up pictures along the way. Uh, again, this is a Jean-Guy Dubay drawing here on the upper right. Um, what he did was do me a big uh, blueprint, and I just photocopied the blueprint, cut out the the appropriate pieces and pasted them onto a styrofoam board uh, block at the moment. And it just sits there at Carpinteria where it should. So it's the right footprint and everything, uh, but it's still a stand in. The Southern Pacific Historical and Technical Society did a combination 17 kit uh, several years ago that was done by Bantam Models. And I have it, I just haven't built it yet. Summerland. These two pictures up top are Summerland. This is um, this is a later picture. This one is is just I think they just finished it. Um, the two pictures below are also um, the same standard depot, but these are in Canby, Oregon, and my son lives up near there, so we went there with my oldest granddaughter one afternoon and had a great time and I took a bunch of pictures. Pictures are always, always a good idea if you can find them. Um, the Summerlin Depot was torn down years ago. So um, I need to make do as I can. The Santa Barbara Depot is still there. So collect pictures. Um, this is one of mine here on the right. I can't remember. I think this is a Donald Duke picture here on the left. And then again, this is a Jean-Guy Dubay drawing. Back in 1998, the city of Santa Barbara, which owns the depot, decided that they would do some refurbishing. And they did a whole series of, of full-scale plans. And so I have a copy of the plan. So it, it's really helpful for when I get around to finally building this. They have had their problems. This is 1914. There was a little bit of water there then. We are having a drought now. The tracks run through here somewhere. But this is all water. And this is what it looked like afterwards. A total disaster. But here's. Here's the depot on my, my layout. I just took a photograph, pasted it on a block and sits it, sit it down where it's supposed to be. The Goleta Depot is still in existence, but it's been moved. But you can go there and take pictures, measure it if you want. This is another Jean-Guy Dubay drawing. This is a Charlie Lang picture in its original location um, with, with the local switcher there and a couple of SP maintenance away. Right now, all I have is a, a picture pasted on the fascia. It'll go right in here and it won't fit. So I have this idea of cutting it in half and having the back open, putting uh, some plastic plexiglass or Lexan or something along the back end and doing the interior so you can see inside and have the station there. So that's the plan for that. 
It'll get there someday. Surf, I don't have any room for surf, so it's gonna be really flat. Um, maybe I'll use the other half of the depot that I cut off at, um, at Goleta. It is a combination 22. There are variations. Um, surf in particular added this whole building down at the end. Um, they, in fact, tore the depot down in about 70, 71, and the only thing left was this building. And they used that for the, the train orders. The operator was in that building until the end. Um, combination 22 depots, there's an HO kit from uh, American Limited that's a laser kit. It works pretty well. Here's another combination 22 at Lompoc. Uh, down here in the lower left is, uh, is my Lompoc and all I have is a picture of it right now, but there is space for it. Uh, it's an interesting modification. It's hard, not really easy to see, but there's a stairway here going up to the second level. They had a doorway on the second level on the back side, and you could go into the upstairs from outside the building without going in. Little things like that will make the building. Oops, let's go back. Casmelia is the last one. They did have a, a combination 23 depot. Before that, they had a telegraph office. I'm probably going to go with the telegraph office just because it's different. The shelters, this is Serena, um, just a small little shelter. This is a picture of Serena. I live, a, I could walk here in about five minutes from my house, except that where this road is, is where the 101 freeway is now. The tracks are still there. You, I know right exactly where the, the shelter was, but um, it hasn't changed much. This one's been my hardest depot or shelter. I have a picture of the Eaglet shelter and the Eaglet shelter was moved to Tangare, which is on my layout. It served as um, an arrival station for troops during World War II to Camp Cook. And they enclosed the building and put a ceiling in, two windows and a door and a counter. But that was all done in 1942. This is information from Henry Bender. And it, it, apparently it was uh, taken off the rolls in 1960. Whether it even existed that long, I don't know. I've contacted Vandenberg Historian and they don't have any information either. So I keep looking. Here's the Miramar shelter picture I took of the replacement shelter. The original shelter looked like the postcard in the lower right. And this is again, a drawing by Jean-Guy Dubay. Um, the people that own the Miramar Hotel decided they'd put the shelter up. There is some talk that um, Rick Caruso, who owns the Rosewood at Miramar Resort now, is going to put one in, but it hasn't happened yet. It was a flag stop, so it doesn't really matter. Trains don't stop there anymore. Industries, there's a whole lot of industries I'd like to do. I'll just show you a few. Um, this is Carpinteria. This was the Carpinteria um, Mutual Lemon Association packing house. It's currently a brewery, uh, Island Brewing. And I just took photographs of it, pasted it on, on uh, some cardstock and put it up next to the track. And I'm not probably not gonna do a whole lot more than that. This is a picture of uh, what's left of the old um, fish bean warehouse. They packed lima beans. Um, it was torn down and condos were built here, but they were built in the same style as the packing house. So it's all like corrugated metal on the outside of these and it, different different levels and things. So it, it actually has the feel of the old packing house. Um, 
I have a stand in building right now. This probably isn't going to stay, but I liked how it has the upper parts and all the the different pieces for it. So I just uh, I put it on the layout um, actually came from a friend of mine's layout who passed away this last year. Um, and I had operated down there a couple of times. So it's it's also a memory. Uh, a couple of other, other little ones. This is a, a Walther's kit, and it reminded me of the Standard Oil Company, which is in that uh, Santa Barbara industrial area, as is the McNall uh, building supplies. Um, when I first started looking at things, you could still find rails in the asphalt. McNall building supplies was right in here. Um, but the tracks went right down that way. Where these trees are down here is the main line. It, it just went down there. It was like a stub came off. And that's how I've built it. This is uh, Union Oil. These tanks have since been removed, but I'm gonna have them on where, where it is. And this, this structure has been, will be built there in the corner. You've already seen this. This is the Goleta Lemon Association. You can see the two tracks here. Um, this other building was a produce building. It sat out here and between two other tracks. The main line's way out here. But all these are, are run off a spur that also serves the, the lumber company. So here's the, the produce building. They moved it. They've, the city of Goleta has saved it and is designated as a historic landmark. So we'll put it on. This is the lumber company here. And this is what Hayward Lumber looks like today. It's just a spur, but they bring um, center beam um, flats in with lumber and offload. It's the last uh, remaining industry that's served by rail in Santa Barbara, in Santa Barbara City area, the South Coast. Uh, up in Lompoc, there was a bean warehouse, um, and it had tracks in it. For a long time, you could see where the tracks were in, the, in Laurel Avenue. The main branch tracks go right down the middle, but you could see where the switch was into the bean warehouse. Right now all I have, uh, have is, uh, oops, let's go back. Just a photograph on the wall. This is up at the upper level at the, this is on my layout. The, um, there was a little SW1500 that serviced the diatomaceous earth mine. Eventually I'll repaint the CSX into something more, more like that. This is a 1953, I want to say RLHS excursion up to the mine. Um, this is a 1922 picture with a steam engine down here at the bottom and 22 boxcars, probably filled with diatomaceous earth. So there's tracks down here, there's tracks up here, these tracks up here are the ones that you can see here behind the steam engine. Uh, these are aerial views. You can see the tracks down, down below, up above, and even over here against this warehouse, you can see some of the cover hoppers that were being used at the time. So that's that's that. And this is this is real stand-in. I'm going to kit bash these kits and make it look like some of the, the structures that were up at the mine. But we've got all the trackage in already, and it, it actually has been switched a couple of times. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I would like to go ahead and try the remote operations. I need to start working on those structures and scenery. And, and you know, as we go along, People are always coming up with new technology. Um, 
and there's a possibility for layout expansion. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, backdating, sure. Um, once the track's in, the track didn't move a lot. So then you can backdate. All you need to do is like change out the automobiles or something, because a lot of the industries stayed the same as well. Change some of the, the uh, rolling stock and the locomotives and uh, we're in business. So thanks for watching. Don't go away. I do have a couple of videos that I'd like to share so you can take a trip on the railroad. And the second video is, is an off the wall change of era to 1949. I got bitten by, a, by um, the steam bug. Normally I'm running uh, diesel locomotives in 1994, but um, I'm part of a group that's working on modifying Bachman 280s to make them look more like Harriman's, um, especially SP units. And so um, Jason Hill, who's over in Nevada, has been spearheading this and is doing some 3D castings. And there's a whole bunch of us that are working on that. So that got me going. And then I started looking at how many locomotives I'd need to run the locomotive or the layout that I've been sharing with you. And uh, I came up with nine. So I figured, okay, let's do it. And I had four or five already. So it wasn't a big, a big push. And when I started looking around, somebody had a 210 two brass engine with a decoder and sound in it for about $200. I said, I'll go for that. So that got me going and I'll show the video. But first we'll show a video of the, um, let's see if I can bring it up, a video of the, um, of just running across the, the railroad from Carpinteria to La Batera. This is just the lower level. Let's try this. How about if I press go? You can see everybody can see that? Oh, you know what I did? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. I no. didn't have my sound, but I don't. No, no, you played it. Did you play it in the advance if you did the sounds there? Yeah. So that was Carpinteria. You can see the station, this San Diego on the left. There's a little town called Santa Claus. It's just uh, north of Carpinteria, and we're going to put it right there. I do have a little bit of scenery. This is a lemon grove. Since I have four lemon packing houses on my layout, I probably have to have some lemon groves. <clears throat> this is uh, Summerland. At one time, Seaside Oil had a refinery there. They started there and the first offshore oil drilling in North America was there at Summerland. We're actually passing underneath the Santa Barbara yard at this point. This is called using the space twice. The Miramar Hotel is here, the old style with the blue roofs. They had a Pullman called the National Embassy and a, a lounge car, a, what was it? A cafe lounge from Santa Fe that they actually served hamburgers and things in. So there's a slight grade coming out of <clears throat> up to Santa Barbara. Once you get to Santa Barbara, the industrial area is off to the right. And we're going through on uh, one of the mains, this Coast Starlight sitting over at the station. That's what we're going by on the right.
Definitely needs some scenery though. What was the optical detection doing there that we just passed, Bruce? So asking about the optical detector, there's two of them. It's a, it's a talking detector. It does uh, hot boxes and things. Thank I you. Could stop these. So um, yeah, the optical detector was for for a, a track detection circuit that um, counts the axles, determines the speed of the the train, and periodically, randomly, says that there's a hot bo box on a certain axle. There'll there'll be a defect. There's no defects. It'll say no defects. It's just like a regular SP talking detector. It's a program um, and hardware that was developed by Jim Farrick in Colorado. I think uh, his company is called Boulder Creek Engineering. He sells um, speedometers and scales. Uh, David Parks is on the on the call today. David has some of, of Jim's scales at one of his coal um, operations. I know because I've used it before. Um, just before I start up, the just here on the right is one of John Plocker's um, flagmen. It's just an LED with a little man. You set it down on the tracks and it takes the current and shows you that it's it's live it also works great as a flagman so we're coming in this is the train is on the house track at galita so we're coming into la patera and you can see the the uh, reefers are actually on the lumber spur but you could see the the other part just to the left, the packing house and the produce packing house. And then it goes into the helix and this is where this particular video stops. So um, let me stop sharing this one and I'll do one more. I think I'm at my hour time, aren't I? We started a little late, so. And there are a couple of questions too, so. All right, this is, uh, this is only about three minutes long. Sorry about the sound, it's a little loud. I, I don't think you're sharing. <laughs> and this time, this time, turn the sound on when you share, because you're sharing it as a screen. So share it, do the, the, the video optimization yeah. for video. Hang on. I, yeah, I'm sorry. That's it. No worries. <clears throat> That's what I want to do. Thanks for keeping me honest. Can I do this? Just uh, hit. does that work? There you go. Yep, it just hit the play. Good.
Bruce, this must have been a section where the uh, spline was replaced with the plywood. Cool. Oh, Bruce, we, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, kind of, first off, have your aisle widths been adequate? And what kind of aisle widths do you generally have? The answer to adequacy <clears throat> is no, they're not. <laughs> um, they're too tight. Uh, I really wanted them tighter or wider than they were, but I have a limited space within the garage, and so that's what I did. A uh, story, most of the aisle widths are about 30 to 36 inches wide. Mm. Um, there is a tight spot of 27 inches. And I, I had um, wa the washing machine die on me. And I had to move the washing machine out from where it is hidden inside, outside, and then get a new one back in. and it it fit with about a quarter of an inch on either side of the washing machine. <laughs> so that's a that's a really important insight that you know you should measure everything that has to get out of your layout room to make sure you've left adequate room to get it out. Probably exactly. exactly. Probably that would be a spousal um, issue if you couldn't replace the washing machine. <laughs> probably would be. Um, so I would say uh, that I really enjoy wide aisles. Um, I don't anticipate a large crew. I had, I had a couple of people who were friends of mine in wheelchairs. Um, and both of them have been in the layout and gone around in wheelchairs. So the, the one person had a motorized one and I was really concerned because you take it in, how do you get it back out again? And it turned out that he was able to go all the way into the middle and turn his, his uh, motorized chair around and come right back out again. So there was enough room for that, which uh, kind of surprised me, but I, I was glad for it. Um, I think that probably it'd be better uh, if you're still planning to plan for 48 inch aisles there will always be times when those numbers will go going to be squeezed. But if you start out wider, it's a lot better, a lot more comfortable for the operators. And with two levels, it makes it doubly difficult. But well, I think that planning is the planning of a building that would have sufficient space. I think what your point is that there's always this trade-off between 
the railroad and the space for aisles. So uh, the other question was, what's your minimum ra ma mainline radius? About 30 inches. Cool. Any other questions for, for Bruce? Did, I think I heard, uh, I heard somebody ask me a question. I better not uh, point to somebody. I thought it was David's voice. Mr. Gibbons. Hey Bruce, I, Bruce, I've got a question for you. With regards to spline roadbed, one of the drawbacks I've always heard is that it's hard to go back and attach scenery and things to the edges of it later. You know, when I've done stuff, I just do things on plywood. Can you comment on attaching scenery to spline roadbed? Yes. Um, but back to David's question, I think David, you were gonna ask me about the plywood roadbed when we were going with the cab forward that's all been replaced where right. when that was taken so that was all plywood and to earl's question about attaching um scenery if you noticed in that cab forward as we went by the lemon grove there was a big gap between the plywood and the scenery i have not attached it yet that was I, I do a lot of experimenting on my layout. I try this technique and that technique. Um, I haven't, I, I don't have any uniform technique as I go across the railroad. That scenery was built on a, a fiberglass um, mesh. You know, mm -hmm. that, like you're, you're, when you glass a, a surfboard or something. Um, and I just put plaster on top of it and it's, Fine, but it's not attached to the roadbed. I tried attaching something to all the roadbed. Um, now I'm going to not remember the guy's name. He did an article in either RMC or Model Railroad or years ago about red rosin paper. Anybody remember who it was? Anyway, uh, red rosin paper is something that uh, building trades use. So you can get it at, at uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, <coughs> those kind of And what I did was I attached it using hot glue. And then I paint the paper um, with white glue, just painted with white glue. And it stiffens it up. And then you can put plaster on top of that, but it does connect with hot glue. So the answer Earl was, is hot glue. And, and that worked pretty well with the, with the uh, hardboard, the masonite spline. I did a couple of things with the masonite spline. I, I um, left holes in it so that I could put the feeders through. Um, drilling masonite is not fun. Uh -huh. um, so that's why I left the holes. But like I said, I tried, once I got it in, I tried to have it level to begin with, but it just wasn't uniform. And so the cars would, you know, the cars would tip one way or the other. And there was a mm -hmm. lot of this going on as you went along the tracks. And I just couldn't get rid of that so we ended up stopping other questions i didn't read all the chat so yeah just a just a quick question that um strip led light that you bought from amazon you had a slide that said what it was and i i missed the name okay um, not the one that was underneath the um the the light the decks not but the one that was on the ceiling i think okay it's barina b-a-r-r-i-n-a -R -R -I, I think or b-a-r-i-n-n-a -N -N did i put a um was there a um i'm sorry a link on the on the video yeah no there was a link in your slides i okay. think let me see if i can <clears throat> Yeah, if you can just grab the link, Bruce, uh, yeah, when we get done and throw it in the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, that's what I yeah, was going to do. Yeah, no big deal. Thank you. 
Cool. Two other quick questions, Bruce. Oh, no, I don't see a link in it. Oh, okay, we'll find it then. Uh, let me see if I can find it anyway. Um, okay, questions, keep going. Okay, Bruce, what happened to the gigantic heap of stuff that was in the half of the garage? <laughs> the big question. Um, two things happened to it. I got rid of some of it. Um, some of it is still in the garage underneath the layout. Mm -hmm. Some of this stuff is in our family room to which my spouse says, when are we going to clean up this family room? <laughs> I, when I was looking for a place to put the layout originally, when we first moved into the house, my wife actually said, why don't you put the layout in the family room? And I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. And I'm glad I didn't. Um, it, the layout's a work in progress. I don't want to do that to the family room. My wife calls it clutter, and that includes all my model railroad equipment. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, guys, I put this in the chat. Oh. This is the Barina. I think these are the specific lights. And I'll also put the next chat is, and this is a link to their shop. They have a shop, and they have lots of lights in the shop. I'll put that link up also. Thank you very much, Bill. That's exactly, no worries. That's exactly where I got it. And the other thing you want to look at, um, with lighting is the color. So uh, Barina has different uh, K values. So you want to look at what you want to do, uh, whether you want it warm or cool. I think I went with 4,000. Yep. That, that's actually, I think what that link is, is the 4,000. Yeah. I'm using 6,500 K on my, over my switching layout. I like the cooler colors. I think that's a matter of taste. One more question, Bruce. Early on in your slide presentation, you had a shot of a train. There was a train in the distance. You were talking about the, the main town. And behind the locomotive in that shot was a boxcar with white plastic frames around the car. Was that a clearance checker yes. car by chance? Yeah. That was, um, it was a model, right? Yeah. So I have Vandenberg on my layout. Um, and Vandenberg gets rocket parts. They don't, it used to be an Air Force base. It's now a Space Force base. They never had planes assigned there. Um, but they would get rocket parts in. Ah. And the rocket parts were built other <laughs> places and were brought there. And there are rocket solid rocket booster uh, trains. Mm. If you go go to YouTube and, and search for solid rocket booster trains, um, and they, there are cars. Um, the one I know of is built on a rail box, box car. Mm -hmm. And they just put this clearance on the outside of the box car so that they know that the, the rockets can get through that clearance. So you're absolutely right. That's a clearance car. And that's what it, that's what you were looking at. Thank you. Other questions? Oh. Yeah, Bruce, can you go into a little more detail on the camera that you put in that dummy locomotive? It sounds like something interesting to do. And I, I'm gathering <laughs> it's a Bluetooth camera, right? OK, hang on a second. Let me. Take a quick look. Well, he looks at that, Larry. I will remark, at least I'm standing off to the side track from where the train is. You're on the track. Mm. It's an SP locomotive, Dave. It ain't going anywhere. Yeah. Ouch. Uh, you know, this is another, another one of these, um, Amazon things. Hang on. Let's, uh, let me share the screen again for just a second. 
um, if you take that description, hidden spy camera, Wi-Fi, 1080p, video, mini, mini camera, wireless, 150 degrees, take all that sort of garbage and put it into Amazon, you'll find it. I will tell you that I've made it work, um, but it has some issues with it. And what I want to do is make it so that it works well enough that I can use it on, um, on that OBS program that I've got so that people can see via remote. Um, they, can, they can look at the, the engine, engineer's view as they go along. It's got to be um, available <clears throat> through the internet. Yeah, I took a dummy locomotive and I put in a mobile decoder with sound and two big giant speakers and I stuck it in there and it works real well. So this looks like another good use for a dummy locomotive. Yeah. Um, check with the guys down at Silicon Valley because they, they do the same thing. And they've got a camera that works pretty well. Um, Silicon Valley does or was doing some remote operations. Um, and so that's it's a valuable resource within the division. I think the other thing is if you want to take if you just if you're looking to just make videos, um, we actually have a it's a GoPro, what they call a session. So it doesn't have a screen. It's just a little cube. And it'll actually fit on an HO flat car pretty well. And you can just run it. And it also has Wi-Fi. So you can, you know, look at it remotely as it goes, it goes, but it records. Um, we use one of those actually at the Osco Club in Pleasanton. I bought, got a big battery and made a little card up that, that fits into a gondola and holds the battery in the camera. And we run it all day long with an iPad up behind the glass so that they get a so the public gets a uh, essentially a locomotive view, but that's actually pushing a gondola in front of the engine. So it's not built in there. We've been talking about trying to build into the engine, but it requires a bit of work. There wasn't, um, for a long time, they were selling these little cube cameras that um, you, they aren't attached to anything. <laughs> um, they record on a, on a micro SD card. And that's what I use to make that video that the, the cab video that you saw. And I did exactly what Phil's talking about. I took the camera and I, I made a little foam base for it. There you go. Um, what a go this is what a session looks like it's a little yeah. basically it's a little cube like that you put a a micro mini micro card in it but they've got an app that runs that gives you a preview so you can see it, it yeah. it's pretty nice for basic stuff so i just i put it in a gondola and pushed it in front of the the locomotive and then i could get the the cab view without doing all the the neat stuff in the cab but i, I challenge you larry go ahead and do it it's <laughs> I I got it. I, I put it in, but I it all fits. I just mm -hmm. have to make it work so that I could I I connected it up to my um my phone, my smartphone, and I ran the dummy and it worked great. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a whirl. <laughs> yeah, but I, I need to figure out how to get it from the smartphone to the remote uh sharing device. So yep. that's that's not too hard. Any other questions? Well, thanks, oh, yes. Bruce. Oh. There you go. Somebody did it. Bob, thank you very much. It was Howard Zane. He was the red rosin person. Well, thanks, Bruce. That was that that was really cool and, and inspirational for those of us that don't have a layout to get going. Um, so get ready, give uh, give Bruce a round of applause, and uh, we appreciate it.